Hey everybody, JD Mills here, and today I'm going to talk about something that is very important to the fantasy sci-fi genres, and that is the art, if you could call it that, of lore dumping, and really of exposition and explaining your secondary world. The especially challenging thing when it comes to fantasy, sci-fi, and any other genre or story that has a secondary world is the fact that you have to explain that secondary world. In Steven Erickson's own words in a discussion, uh, you could be writing a contemporary fiction and you could say, oh, they went to France. And the reader will understand what that means. You don't have to explain where or what France is. However, in a fantasy story, if you're going to say the hobbits are going to Mordor, well, what's Mordor? Where is that? Why is that significant? Explaining these things in text and in prose is a skill, and it's a thing that some authors do better than others, and there's no really one right way to do it. About four or five months ago, I was listening to an audiobook for The Infernal City by Greg Keyes, and if you're not familiar with that novel, basically it's an Elder Scrolls tie-in novel. It came out in 2009, so like two years before The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim came out, and became the world's biggest kicked dead horse. So it came out right after the life cycle of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, and it was kind of leading up into the hype of Skyrim. So it's in this weird area where this novel came out while the Elder Scrolls is popular, but it's not the mainstream sort of like powerhouse we see today. And I thought I would like it when I picked it up. I mean, I love the Elder Scrolls as a video game franchise. I grew up with it. The lore is fascinating, and the world building in the games is just fantastic. I also thought I would like it because the guy narrating it, Michael Page, is the same guy who did most of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, so I'd kind of fallen in love with that man's voice after spending multiple hundreds of hours with it. And, well, I was right. His performance did not disappoint. The Infernal City is the only book I read in 2022 that I didn't like. I tried to like it. I liked aspects of it, but it was so jarring to me. And the main reason why I didn't like it was because of one simple thing, and that is because it lore dumps like nobody's business. It is constantly going into things that are not relevant into the plot, explaining and talking and just, just talking about history and gods and situations that have nothing to do what's ha with what's happening in the narrative and never comes up again and talked about by people who would never know it. It's basically like if you were in the 1950s and you went into a coal mine and asked the coal miner to explain rocket science to you, <laughs> and he did. However, one of the things that Stephen King says in On Writing is that just as we can learn good writing from good books, we can learn how to not do bad writing from bad books. And in fact, bad books are probably more important to learn from than good books. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at different examples of delivering exposition to your readers. We're gonna be looking at The Infernal City by Greg Keyes, Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson, and The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. Uh, I must warn minor spoilers for all three books. All the passages that I've picked are right in the, you know, first couple chapters. Um, but if you don't want to hear them, go ahead and skip to the end. Uh, but I'm going to try not to spoil anything. So the Infernal City starts right off the bat in the prologue, bombarding you with information. I'm just going to read a couple of passages here. Stendar, Grain Swore, and her South Nibbin Twang. What was that? A tsunami? Her feeble human gauge searched out through the dusk. Now, calling out specifically Stendar is interesting because Stendar is like a god of like the undead and stuff. And it's like, I, I feel like you could have just said by the gods or by the nine. By the nine is a great one. Uh, it's very evocative. But, but to specifically call out Stendar, it's awkward. It, it's a strange curse. Um, normally curses roll off the tongue and Stendar doesn't really feel like a curse. It feels maybe more like, like if you were a paladin of Sendar. You might be like, for Sendar, But uh, it's just it's strange and out of place. And then we call out her South Nibbin Twang. My problem with that is that we don't know where South Nibbin is. 
and it never comes up again in the text. It, it's a completely useless detail that is just adding word count. Anyway. No, Ithek murmured. I was off the Somerset Isles when the sea tried to swallow them, and I felt one of those pass under us. And another when I was younger, off the coast of Morrowind. In the deep water, you don't feel much. This is deep water. So, now he's talking about his sailing experience. This really could be wrapped up very simply with, No, I have seen tsunamis, and this isn't it. Um, but we... we <laughs> It's like a, a necessary detail to add in the names of these countries. Just to make him seem like more well-traveled or, you know, just, I feel like it's there because the players of the game will know, well, they'll recognize the names of these countries. It's just checking boxes. But you could easily have made that like, no, I have felt tsunamis and this isn't it. We're in deep water. And when you're in deep water, you don't feel much. I mean, really, you could have just said that but it's over-explaining for the sake of naming places. See anything, came? he called up. My own death nearly, the Nikin lion cat shouted back, his voice rasping hollow as if the ship was in a box. He lithely hauled his sleek body back into the nest. Nothing on the sea, he continued after a moment. Under it, then, Grain said nervously. See, now... What I get really frustrated with, and we kind of saw it back in the previous passage where we see her feeble human gaze, and then um, in a part I didn't read, there's another mention of that other character's humanity. Um, it, it's very strange when you have minor characters and you're just calling out their cultural background, you're calling out their ethnicity or their species, more like a description rather than a narrative. For, for, the, for this Keem character, we really don't need to know that he's a Nikin, a lion cat, because that's confusing. Is he a cat or is, or is he more humanoid? Because I know, as an Elder Scrolls fan, that some Khajiit are more cat-like, are like actual like sentient talking cats, as to where, you know, the ones we see in the games are humanoid and stand on two legs. You know, they're, they're bipedal. Um, and so it's really unclear about whether this character Keem is more bipedal or more of, you know, more of a quadruped kind of cat. And, you know, you really could have done the same thing. Keem doesn't come up again. Keem is not like a main character. You never hear from Keem again. But yet we're super confused trying to figure out what he looks like and who he is. We don't know. We're never going to know what a Nikin Alliant cat is. It, it, it's not important. And thus, I, I just don't think it should be included. You could have just made this any old deckhand. You don't have to specify. You don't have to talk about their life story. They're a random character. They're not a main perspective character. They're not a supporting character. They are one line in the prologue of a set of characters that you're never going to hear from again. It's overloaded with detail. It's confusing. I saw an oblivion gate open once, she said, when my father worked in Leowen. I saw things. It feels a little like that. But Martin's sacrifice, they say it can't happen again, and it doesn't look like a gate. So, <sighs> I have mixed feelings about this paragraph. One, I feel like somebody who lived in Cyrodiil during the Oblivion Crisis would obviously know what a gate, firsthand what a gate looks like. So that makes sense. So for her to talk about this event like, like it was firsthand, like she witnessed it on the news, it's almost like you're talking about something major. Like, like nowadays, when, we, when something significant happens, it'll be on the news and we know about it pretty much firsthand because there's so much information. But during the time period that the Elder Scrolls kind of has and the technology that they have available to them, they don't have news, they don't have social media, they have word of mouth, and they have stories. And stories are imperfect, and they get exaggerated. But yet, she speaks about what Martin Septim did as if she was there and knew him, and she's just a random person. And this is really what this book does a lot and bothers the hell out of me. It's just like random people who wouldn't know anything talking about things as if they were there. There's also the fact that she just talks about Martin Septim in such a casual first name basis. That is very strange. Um, for the medieval adjacent setting that the Elder Scrolls is, like most fantasy, 
you know, typically like common people are going to talk about the rulers and the people that lord over them in a more formal way. There's going to be accolades, there's going to be titles. Even now, we when we're talking about presidents and we're talking about like prime ministers, you know, government officials, we're typically using at the very least their full name, uh, if not using their full title. It's like, remember on Tuesday when Martin shot that three-pointer, right? It's very casual, very familiar, and this person would not feel that way. Skipping ahead, uh, now we're going to go into a passage that's about halfway through chapter one. Uh, this is in the perspective of Anna Ig, who is one of the perspective, actual like main characters. And she's a very young, inexperienced, like sort of herbalist. And again, like a common person grew up in a fishing town, um, is presumed to be uneducated. They had made their way from the hills of the old Imperial Quarter into the ancient gangrous heart of Lilmoth Pussbottom. Imperials had dwelt there too. In the early days, when the Empire had first imposed its will and architecture on the lizard people of Black Marsh, now only the desperate and sinister dwelt here, where patrols rarely came. The poorest of the poor, political enemies of the Argonian and Ex Exile party that now dominated the city, criminals and monsters. So this passage reads very much kind of like a history book. So for her to think in this very encyclopedic way is super unnatural and it's just, it's lore dumping. She's not, this isn't talking about her feelings. Uh, this isn't talking about her perspective or what she sees. This is a very omnipotent look at what happened in this area. Like it's a history book. It's impersonal, it's unbiased. And this is just like, prob th this passage is really just kind of like the thesis behind my whole idea of this book is that this is what it does all the time it's like half history book and it forgets about the characters that are thinking these things i'm sure she knows about what happened you know if, especially if this happened recently and she saw it happen but this should be written in her per biased perspective based off who she is in the world not this omnipotent view again it's like she was there when things were happening and she has this like higher level of understanding but a 19 year old common like herbalist isn't going to have a, a textbook understanding of the world around them now we're going to talk about gardens of the moon by stephen erickson now erickson's books have a reputation of not holding the reader's hand or being confusing and and yeah you know they kind of are but what i like about the way he presents his world building is everything before before Erickson and his co-author Ian C. Ethelmont actually started writing, they had like 125,000 years worth of history already developed because they're archaeologists and they're anthropologists, and they developed all of this. And so Gardens of the Moon and the rest of the Malazan Book of the Fallen are written in a way where... It, it assumes that you need no help, that you already are clued in to what's happening, which makes it great on a reread, but can make it extremely confusing upon a first read. But even though Gardens of the Moon took me three attempts to actually get through, I started it two times before I had, you know, read through Malazan the first time, and I quit two times because I just couldn't wrap my head around what was happening. And then I got started getting through it. And, and as I got through the series, all of these things, all of these casual mentions of things, um, you know, they loop back around because they mattered. And so we're going to see a lot of the same things where we see name dropping. We see, you know, characters just talking about things that you think don't really make sense. But the difference with Steven Erickson versus Greg Keyes in The Infernal City is that the random name drops and the places we hear about all these random details aren't actually random. They're very specifically placed because they do matter to the plot, because they're going to come up again. And so by mentioning them early on, they're getting placed into your head so that you can recognize them later. One of the best examples of this is that in the beginning of every Malazan book, there is a dramatis personae. And if you are picking up Gardens of the Moon for the first time, and you never read it, you're going to read the dramatis personae first, because it's before the prologue or anything, and you're going to read the Malazan Empire or Malazan Empire. One arm's host. I already have a question. Who's one arm? Don't worry about it. Tattersail, Cadre Sorceress, Second Army, a reader of the Deck of Dragons. 
we are one character in to the dramatis personae and we're already asking the question what's a cadre sorceress uh she's in the army so okay a, a, a cadre of sorceresses of of wizards or whatever uh, makes sense a reader of the deck of dragons now that is very evocative it's vague and evocative and it makes you ask a question well what is the deck of dragons that kind of sounds like tarot cards and you kind of start to get an idea of what that might be we're gonna go to the next one hairlock cadre mage second army okay they're in the same army um i also notice that mage is called out specifically differently than sorceress is there a difference between mage and sorceress an unpleasant rival of Tashrin. Who's Tashrin? Kalat. Kadra Mage. Second Army. Tattersail's lover. Okay, so from what we learned just by reading Tattersail, we know that this Kalat has a connection to her. And then Talk the Younger. Scout. Second Army. So now we learn that uh, there aren't just mages in the Second Army. There, there's a scout. And uh, a claw agent, badly scarred at the Siege of Pale. Okay, the, a claw. The, the word agent implies that the claw is more uh, covert. And the Siege of Pale. Where's that? W what is that? Th that's obviously significant because it's capitalized. Siege of Pale. Proper noun. So I'm not going to go through the whole dramatis personae. But the whole point of reading this before you start reading the book is because it's introducing you to these concepts that you don't necessarily know what they mean. But as you read, you're going to start recognizing these words, and eventually the pieces get put together. So I'm going to skip to chapter one um, during a scene where Gano's Perrin and Adjunct Lorne are writing together and, and just talking. It had been a long time since somebody's title had been enough to straighten him up. But this was the adjunct to the Empress, Lassine's personal servant, an extension of her imperial will. The last thing the captain wanted was to show his misery to this young, dangerous woman. Now, this tells you a lot, very quickly. The adjunct is not somebody to be messed with. Adjunct, as in, like, adjacent to the empress. And, and what I really like here in this sentence, like, how we... In the Infernal City, we name drop the Emperor Martin Septon, who wasn't Emperor for more than, like, I don't know, a week. And here we get adjunct to the Empress, comma, Lassine's personal servant. So even though we're name dropping Empress Lassine, we know that she's the Empress. And, and the context is, is that this is a captain of the Empire, and he's specifically riding with the Empress's right hand. So... You know, the people actually, like, the people's perspectives that we're hearing from would know the information that they are giving. Up ahead, the road began its long, winding ascent. A salty wind blew from their left, whistling through the newly budding trees lining the side of the road. By mid-afternoon, the wind would breathe hot as a baker's oven, carrying with it the stench of mudflats. And the sun's heat would bring something else as well. The captain hoped to be back in can by then. So we get mention of a place called Can, K-A-N. What is that? I don't know yet. He tried not to think about the place as they rode toward. In his years of service to the Empire, he had seen enough to know when to shut everything down inside his skull. This was one of those times. So we know that immediately that the captain has been with the Empire and in the military for a long time. The adjunct spoke. You've been stationed here long, Captain? Aye. The man growled. Now, I. Such a simple word, um, but it, it gives you a very clear picture of the way that they speak. Like, this is a this is a distinguished officer, and I is typically more of like an informal kind of word. That specific phrase really gives you an idea of, like, what kind of attitude these, to these people have. The woman waited, then asked, How long? He hesitated. Thirteen years, adjunct. You fought for the Emperor then, she said. Aye. And survived the Purge. That's interesting. So we know that there was an Emperor in the last 13 years, and that there was a Purge. And that, for some reason, the Captain survived. Would he have been a target? I... What does that mean? The Captain threw her a look. 
If she felt his gaze, she gave no indication. Her eyes remained on the road ahead. She rolled easily in the saddle, the scabbarded longsword hitched under her left arm, ready for mounted battle. Her hair was either cut short or drawn up under her helm. Her figure was lithe enough. The captain mused. Finished? she asked. I was asking about the purges commanded by Empress Lassine following her predecessor's untimely death. Interesting. So now we learn a bit more about the purges, um, and, and that Lassine started doing things very quickly after her predecessor died. The captain gritted his teeth, ducked his chin to draw up the helm's strap. He had had time to shave, and the buckle was chafing. Not everyone was killed adjunct. The people of Itkokan aren't exactly excitable. None of those riots and mass executions that hit the other parts of the Empire. We all just sat tight and waited. So now we're getting a view of... We know that this purge had hit the whole Empire, but Itko Can, which we, we mentioned a place called Can before, so maybe that's shorthand. Uh, Itko Can, we're getting an idea of what their culture is like. They're not the kind of people to just jump on whatever, you know, like slaughter is going through the rest of the Empire. They sit and they wait. They're patient people. I take it, the adjunct said with a slight smile. You're not noble-born, Captain, he grunted. If I'd been noble-born, I wouldn't have survived, even here in Itkokan. We both know that. Her orders were specific, and even the droll Kanese didn't dare disobey the Empress, he scowled. No. Up through the ranks, adjunct. So. She's asked... There's a lot of information communicated there. Apparently nobles are being killed in some sort of purge. And even in the calm place of Itkokan, nobles would be killed. Uh, we know that just the fact that the adjunct had asked the captain whether he had been, you know, how he survived the purge shows that he is noble now, but he wasn't noble when he was born. So he rose through the ranks he, he earned his place, and thus he wasn't a target of the purge that the Empress Lucine had done when she took power. We also see that the Empress is a very powerful person. The fact that the moment she takes power, she orders some sort of purge of nobility, and even the most calm of her subjects, the, the most thoughtful people, uh, they're going to do what she says. She rules through some sort of fear. Your last engagement? Wiccan Plains. They rode in silence for a time, passing the occasional soldier stationed on the road. Off to their left, the trees fell away to jagged heather, and the sea beyond showed its white-capped expanse. So, even though in that moment, Wiccan Plains doesn't come back up. It's just, it's just something that he says, and it ends the conversation. It, it almost gives the implication that that, that might have been a rough assignment. And the thing that I like about that is that like the, the, it's again it's introducing us to the to the concept of the Wiccan planes because the Wiccans and the Wiccan planes come up again and they matter to the story. He Erickson isn't just putting that in there to make the world seem big. He's putting that in there intentionally because he wants us to know the word Wiccan and he wants us to know that they live in the Wiccan planes. But that that is a very extreme example of like show don't tell. It's very, you know, it can be very hard to follow, but I, I love this kind of storytelling. And I'm going to talk about a firm medium, a middle ground here, and that is Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. And this is a book I haven't got very far in yet. Um, I got distracted by other things after I started it, um, but I really, I really need to read all of it. Uh, one of the things that is really cool about the way that we do world building in this book is that every other chapter, it, it changes from east to west. And the culture is completely different depending on where you're reading from. Uh, chapter 3 is in the east. She would never wake in this room again. Choosing day had come. The day she had awaited since she was a child, and risked like a fool when she decided to break seclusion. By asking Sousa to hide the outsider in Orizma, she had also risked both of their lives. So, we get... A ton of information just from that little paragraph. Choosing day. Proper noun. This is obviously some very important event that, pro you know, it's probably like some coming to age 
uh, something that you're wait like a graduation, like a high school, college graduation, something like that. Um, she's been awaiting it since she was a child, and she risked it when she hid somebody, an, an outsider. So outsiders aren't allowed here. And sh she could have risked her own life. She could have risked her choosing day um, by doing this thing that she did. Her stomach turned like a watermill. She scooped up her uniform and wash bag passed the sleeping Ashari, and stole out of the room. The south house stood in the foothills of the bear's jaw, the mountain range that loomed over Cape Hassan. So Cape Hassan. What is that? It's, it's obviously a location, probably where they're at right now. And, and, I, and um, foot. maybe the bear's jaw doesn't come up again. Maybe it does. But it is relevant, because if they're in Cape Hassan, and this mountain range looms over it. They see it every day. That's a huge part of the imagery. Along with the other three houses of learning, it used to train apprentices for the high sea guard. Tane had lived in its halls since she was three. Okay, so then we skip a, a little bit ahead. And we're going to see some of these details. This is just on the next page. We're going to see some of these details already starting to come back around. It was a slow procession through Cape Hassan. Many citizens had woken early to see the apprentices ride to the temple. They threw their salt flowers onto the streets and filled every pathway, craning for a glimpse of those who might soon be God-chosen. So choosing day is some holiday, obviously, definitely taken very seriously. It probably has a religious value, and, uh, you know, everybody's coming to watch it. Th this is not something to be taken lightly. Tane tried to concentrate on the warmth of the horse, the clop of its hooves, anything to stop thinking of the outsider. Souza had agreed to take the Anish man into Arisma. Of course she had. She would do anything for Tane, just as Tane would do anything for her. So, we learn immediately that the person who had taken this outsider off of Tane's hands, it, they're very close. And they're... they're <laughs> They're doing something extremely risky by helping this person. So we're immediately being communicated with what this is communicating that Tane and Souza are compassionate people. They like to help people even when it's at the risk of, you know, their own lives. Another detail that's becoming apparent is that the Anish are considered to be outsiders. They're not allowed here in Orisma. Uh, people who bring them here are punished by death. And that kind of alludes to some sort of conflict some sort of like isolationist policy it begins to paint a very vivid picture of this place that tane and Souza live in what do we learn from prior to the orange tree and gardens of the moon what we learn is that if you're going to be dropping these details in a way that doesn't explain themselves you know that that isn't just telling you these things that isn't just like oh you know i was in morrowind when this thing happened when you know it, these, these are grounded perspectives right they, these things that we're learning are from the perspectives of people who would reasonably know the information that's being communicated and it is filtered by their own biased perspective the other element is that these facts that we're learning are immediately relevant or at least eventually relevant to the plot, to the story that we're actually reading as to where in the Infernal City, we are learning about random facts about the world of the Elder Scrolls that will never come up again. Things that you'll never need to know to understand the actual plot or to understand the significance of things that happen. You know, to understand the significance of Tane taking in this outsider, you need to understand why that's such a taboo thing to do. And and then you need to understand the significance of what she could have lost. Choosing Day is this incredibly, incredibly important cultural event that probably happens every year, every couple of years. It's a holiday, it's celebrated, and she could have been killed or denied that because of her own compassion. And in Gardens of the Moon, through the passage, what's communicated is some recent history of the Empire. Stuff that's immediately, like, relevant to the people who are talking about it being so high up in the chain of command. The captain having seen this purge being, like, one step below the requirement of being killed. The fact that they 
ha that he had once served an emperor and now serves the empress and that this empress like immediately upon taking power is so authoritative and scary that even the calmest of people are going to murder their nobility and, and why do they do that and, and, and it leaves more questions that become relevant later within the text we learn a lot about the woman he's talking to the adjunct and how she's this also this very powerful badass woman you don't want to mess with that she has like the ear of the empress lassine so much is communicated in just a page of dialogue between these characters and then we have the infernal city where we just have some fishermen that read a Wikipedia page and they're just spouting off random facts that have no significance to the greater plot. Hey, thanks for watching. If this video was at all helpful to you, if you heartily disagree with me, please let me know. I know that comparing a video game tie-in novel to Malazan Book of the Fallen is kind of like getting a burger from Circle K and then being upset that it's not as good as like a Gordon Ramsay burger. My only hope with this video is that it's an opportunity to learn a little bit about world building and about exposition and kind of different ways to do that. So anyway, have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.